I created this system for transferring super and regular 8mm film to digital movie files, up to 4K if you want. I've had several people contact me wanting more information, and I promised some tips and upgrades to the workflow. In this video, I'll detail the conversion parts needed, and then show some simple tips to keep the system working as well as possible. I'll also talk about the post-production workflow and why it's so important for good results. Let's start with the nuts and bolts. The projector, of course, is an old Canon S400, first sold way back in 1969. It features a slow motion control, which basically ran the film much slower so you could see all the blurry details. It seems like there are still quite a few of these projectors on the market or sitting in people's attics or closets. First, the motor parts. This is a Two Trees stepper motor, NEMA 17. It has high torque and uses up to 1.5 amps. It's actually made for 3D printers, as well as CNC and robotic applications. It has threaded mount points on the front, which come in handy for installation. It also comes with a cable and connector. You can use the connector end attached to the motor, but you'll need to cut off the other end and rewire it. This is the color mapping of the cable outputs. This comes in really handy when you have to wire the motor to the driver. Speaking of driver, this is the stepper motor driver I used. Everything is labeled, so it's pretty easy to wire up. The final piece of the motor system is this stepper motor speed regulator. I find it very useful in fine-tuning how fast you want the system to operate. I generally go one or two frames per second. The other handy thing is that this control has a start-stop switch and a motor reverse switch. This is the wiring diagram for the three parts, the controller, the driver, and the motor. There's a little bit of soldering, but mostly push and screw connectors. This is the pulley which attaches to the motor. The existing belt works fine as long as it's in good shape. Now the shutter parts. This is a cheap remote control for the camera. Since it's being broken apart anyway, no point in buying name brand stuff. I'm not sure why, but I can't find it anymore on Amazon. But really, any brand remote will work as long as it's the wired type. This is the hinge lever momentary contact switch I used to trip the camera shutter. I couldn't find this exact switch since I bought it a few years ago, but this model number is something very similar. Now the light. Here's the bulb. As I said, it's actually an automotive LED dome light replacement. It says the color temperature is 6500 Kelvin. I think this is pretty accurate as I found the most pleasing color results can be had when setting the camera white balance to the electronic flash setting. This is the festoon lamp holder that I used to construct the light fixture. The bracket came from a discarded projector part. This is the LED light driver. I'm not 100% sure you need this, but it's supposed to regulate the voltage that goes to the LED therefore providing more consistent brightness. I don't have a problem with flicker, so something's working right. This is the camera mount. It's a Zacuto DSLR base plate. Unfortunately, they no longer sell these, but you might be able to find one cheap on eBay. You could use this mount, but you'd have to shim it to get the right height for your camera. The camera I used is the Panasonic Lumix S5, a full-frame unit. I highly recommend this Leowa 25mm macro lens, as it's the only one I found that allows you to fill the digital camera frame with a tiny Super 8 image, and does so with amazing sharpness and edge-to-edge -edge detail. I happen to have one with an Icon mount and a Metabones adapter, but I think they sell a direct L mount for the Lumix camera. One other tip about the camera settings. I recommend capturing a full-frame 24-megapixel JPEG image for each frame. This gives maximum resolution and greatest flexibility for framing and fix-ups in post. And it doesn't take all that much space on the internal camera card. I think that's about it for parts. I'm not sure I mentioned it, 
in the original video, but I don't rewind the film through the Canon projector. I have another unmodified projector that I use for that. They're so cheap and easy to find. I figured it was easier than trying to rig the modified Canon to run at high speed in reverse. One other tip. Make sure the whole system is mounted on a very strong and stable board or table. In fact, I'd recommend a metal plate if you have it. When I first started using the system, I noticed a slight focus change in long reels. It turns out that I'd placed rubber feet on the four corners of the mounting board, and there would be very slight downward shifting of the center of the board as the transfer progressed. Believe it or not, this was enough to throw off the focus a little bit. So I got rid of the feet and made the board flush. Like I said, it would probably be better if the whole thing was mounted on steel or aluminum. If I find the right piece of metal, I might do this one day. Now something else I consider essential, especially for old film. This is a product called FilmGuard. I'm not affiliated or sponsored by them in any way. FilmGuard is a film cleaner and lubricant. It's not real cheap, but a little goes a long way. Spray a bit on a soft, all-cotton cloth and gently wipe your film from beginning to end, using a new part of the cloth every minute or so. It's amazing how much dirt is on some films. It seems a bit oily, but it does clean remarkable amounts of dirt from the film. The residue it leaves on the film seems to hide a lot of the small scratches on the non-emulsion side. It's kind of a poor man's liquid gate transfer. I've not had a problem with seeing streaking on the film transfers, and it also seems to greatly help in preventing dirt buildup in the projector gate. The manufacturer claims it's safe for all types of film, including those with magnetic soundtracks. So far, so good. I also found my old Super 8 guillotine splicer. I find that some reels have bad splices or short leaders, and these issues should be fixed before transferring. This splicer precisely cuts the film, and you can apply a tape splice and cut out the perfs for a great fit. The tape folds over to complete the splice. There used to be roll tape available for this splicer, but I can't seem to find any now. I don't know if there are any of these still out there, but it works great. Finally, there are two small modifications I've made to the projector parts to help smooth the transfer process. Inside, I've added this little latch to hold the projector gear securely in the run or play position. Since I took out some of the old linkage, the gears had a tendency to slowly move toward the rewind position. This solves that problem. The other thing I did was to add a small latch onto the lamp cover next to the original latch. This solved the problem of the lamp cover not latching securely at the top. I also put in a screw and washer to hold the cover to an existing threaded hole. Now here's a quick summary of the post-production process I use. First, I take the JPEG images from the card and load them into DaVinci Resolve. I use the Panasonic V-Log LUT to do a basic color grade, maybe changing the brightness, contrast, or saturation as needed. On the last node, I add Neat Video 5, using their grain reduction, some anti-flicker, and dirt remover. I usually do all this at 1920 by 1080 p HD at 24 frames per second. If you set the cleanup at high levels, you can get some weird artifacts in quick moving footage. I found it's better to physically clean the film before transferring, so you don't have to use as much digital cleanup in post. If your film is handheld and you're happy with the resolution, you could stop here. Since a lot of my early filmmaking was done on a tripod, I found the unsteadiness of Super 8 distracting. After trying the stabilizers in both Adobe Premiere and DaVinci Resolve, I settled on using the Avid Media Composer built-in stabilizer. I'm not sure why, but it does the best job of simply steadying the film jitter without being overly influenced by other movement in the frame. I happen to have used Avid's for many years, and for some reason this process just works. For the icing on the cake, I export from the Avid in HD. 
and then run the footage through Topaz Lab's Video Enhanced software. Using AI technology, this software does a great sharpen and up-res to 4K for the final file. I suppose you could work in 4K all the way through, but it doesn't seem to make much difference in the final result. If you have the computer power and want to be a perfectionist, go ahead. I think that pretty much wraps it up. This is some more footage transferred from Kodachrome Super 8 shot in 1980, 41 years ago. Kodachrome film usually holds up great over time. Kodak itself did most of the processing, and it involved adding dyes to what was basically a black and white substrate. As a result, Kodachrome film usually retains its brilliant colors and tight grain over many decades. I still have a lot more film to transfer, so there may be additional updates in the future. If you'd like to see more videos on the great analog-digital divide, hit like and please subscribe.